G'day guys and welcome to Life in the Peloton. I'm Mitch Docker and we've got a really cool guest for you this week, Corey Williams. Now you may have heard of him, he hails from South Central LA. Corey has been a hugely successful one day racer and a regular winner on the US Criterium scene. He's also one of the founders of the Legions of LA Los Angeles racing team. He established his team way back in 2019 with his older brother, Justin Williams, and they had the goal of changing the diversity and the inclusion in cycling. Apart from trying to change the diversity in cycling, they have also set out to change US cycling altogether, as they have recognized that the traditional cycling racing and media really wasn't hitting the mark with the audience who were trying to follow the fast-paced US sports, you know, like NFL, NBA. So instead of just trying to follow the traditional pathways, you know, of cycling over in Europe, they went about trying to make changes that people in their home country could really relate to and understand and follow. One of the most important things is, I think, is how we look. Cycling, how it is perceived. This is very important when it comes to changing cycling in the US and making it more relatable to that US fan base. Corey and his brothers have recognized this and just fully embraced their own individual style and just brought it into their team, Legions of LA. If you've seen them, you'll know what I mean. And now with the help of Rafa, they've put that feel into a kit as well. We come from a uh, popular culture where, you know, what you wear is, is how you feel, you know, dress good, you know, you feel good and you perform good. So working with Rafa has been amazing because, you know, they have really great designers and, just uh, the way they could get colors to pop on jerseys just like no other and you know the comfort of the jerseys as well i know you know with you know being on the f they they make the best jerseys in the world hands down so like it, it's been amazing to to you know be able to create and see these things come to life uh using rafa it's just a fantastic idea and story and it was brilliant to hear about it from Corey. how it's all moving forward Sit back and enjoy this episode, guys. Here he is, Corey Williams. Well, I'm sitting down here with none other than Corey Williams. Corey, welcome to the podcast. This is Life in the Peloton. Mate, great to have you on the pod. Dude, thanks for having me. I mean, I know it was uh, fast-paced and I, I put some pressure on you to come up with some good questions, so I'm happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. All oh, right, righto. Just build the pressure a little bit more. I love it. I love it. Um, mate, let's just go right back to the beginning because this is something that I'm not right back to the beginning. It's something that I find hard to understand because I struggled with myself getting into cycling in Melbourne and Melbourne wasn't as cycling orientated as it is these days. So pulling on kit as a teenager when I was at school, sneaking off to do training rides, things like this, I sort of kept it underground because going to sort of high school parties at 16 year old, six as a 16 year old, I sort of wasn't telling everyone, yeah, you know what, tonight I'm gonna have to leave early because I've got like a club race on tomorrow morning out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. What I wanna know is for you, growing up in LA, what was it like for you getting into cycling? Because typically when I think of LA, I don't think of cycling. Yeah. And what was that like for you? So how did that all happen? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's super funny. My parents are uh, Belizean. They're from Belize and they are very into cycling. It's like soccer and then it's cycling. So like they, we already came, my parents came over. I'm first generation American. So we already were like kind of different than the other kids. And then uh, hmm. basically my dad would race bikes and we would go to races on the weekend. Uh, I think I was nine years old when I got into racing. Yeah, that's not something that you do. You don't tell everyone that you're wearing tights to, to go around and no. ride a bike. They thought you were weird for riding around with a helmet. <laughs> yeah, well, well, in Australia, not so much because it was, it was still law. But they just certainly <laughs> did. Like I was playing rugby and I'd be like washing my legs off as you know, and then going out to cycling races. Did you keep it underground for quite a long time or how long before you were sort of felt proud enough to say it in front of your friends and your peers and stuff that you were, you know, or they just sort of went, oh, he's doing that weird thing, yeah. cycling, you know? Yeah, I mean, it was funny because in high school, uh, they everyone started riding like fixed gears fix your bikes right it became cool so yeah. i waited until high school before i was like telling everyone that i was uh wearing lycra and and uh racing bikes they thought i did uh dirt biking or, or race motorcycles 
That's it. That's right. I'm still explaining that every so often. People are like, I have to sort of break it down. I'm doing cycling. They're like, oh, what do you mean? Like motocross? I'm yeah. like, I'm not that cool, you know, but, you know, I like that you think that I am sort of at that level. I roll with it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, like that. I race motorcycles. <laughs> Then you sort of scream when they're like, yeah, oh, cool. I'll come around and check it out and stuff. You're like, oh, you know. <laughs> no, nah, my parents, you know, they don't really like people over. So, like, you can't come see the motorcycle, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's cool. Now, tell me about, like, growing up in LA also, like, especially the US, and I'm probably going to be very stereotypical here. You know, I see sort of like, you know, loving, you know, loving football, loving sort of baseball, you know, basketball as well. Mm-hmm. And I get the feeling just sort of looking, you and your brother too, well, your brothers, aesthetically, you guys fit the mold. You've got the sneakers. Mm-hmm. You've got the look. Um, so, tell me sort of about Legions of LA now. This is the team that you and your brother, Justin, have started up. Mm-hmm. Because for me, it seems like you guys have understood what cycling needed in the US. Yeah. And what I mean by that is when we think about the races in the beginning of the US sort of calendar. I'm talking not old, old, but when I was sort of coming up, you know, following Lance Armstrong, mm-hmm. the races like the Tour of California, these races were trying to fo- follow the mold of the the Euro scene. They were trying to be Europe in US. Mm-hmm. And once Lance sort of disappeared, I get the feeling the US sort of fan base struggled to follow that. It's like, well, it's not really what we're used to. Yeah. We're used to following, you know, NFL or basketball, this different feel, whether that's the aesthetic sort of look of it or whether it's just a simple name of, you know, the LA Lakers or, you know, the Legions of LA, yeah. which you guys have, have created. So what I'm sort of trying to ask is, how has this whole team sort of come about? And is it sort of about trying to change this culture of cycling in the US? Yeah. So basically I played football, American football. And I know some people think, you know, the soccer and the football thing. Uh, I played American yeah. football uh, since I was seven, and then I played through high school, right? So we were already into other sports like basketball and football, and all of those things are, like, really fast-paced. I think Americans love seeing things happen, like, really quick. Yeah, Our attention span is pretty short, right? So, like, <laughs> I think it, just having the knowledge of, like, what people actually want to watch and, like, trying to put something together – that feels American because like you said, like they tried to bring tour California over here and make it European. We're like, yeah, we have a lot of fans like, but the, the general mm. public won't get behind it. Right. They see it as a traffic. No. <laughs> They're like, why are we yeah. in traffic right now? And there's a bike race going on. So I think uh, for us closing down like a small street, like it's a, a city block. I, they have crits in uh, Australia. Right. So, just I, I do, yeah. It's a good crit scene here, yeah. Yeah, we just figured like if we can get you know people to come out to crits and see that you know it's like the Tour de France, but the last part of it, yeah, where where things get really serious, yeah. right? So like we figured if we brought everyone out and uh, you know we got a team together that felt like American sports, like Legion of Los Angeles, you know, like L.A. Lakers, you know, yeah, just give someone yeah. something to like hold on to or be a fan of like if you know i could be a fan of legion my kid could grow up and be a fan of legion the the name will never change right so we just kind of tried to take american sports and uh put that towards cycling it's exactly that too because i've watched a few videos and like i said even looking at you guys online whether it's instagram or photos of the team it's something you can it's different yeah you know and the videos i saw i was like this is just a breath of fresh air this isn't cycling we're talking about you know it was funny, but it was relatable and it was sort of inside, a bit more inside. And I think back to what Green Edge, my team, Australian team, was doing years ago with this this video, Backstage Pass. Mm-hmm. I remember The that. idea was, let's yeah, let's find out who these guys are behind these glasses, mm-hmm. this traditional old sport. Let's understand the characters. Then we don't aren't just following them if they're winning or losing. We're actually understanding why someone's doing something, where we're learning a bit more about the characters, which is already what I felt looking into your team. I was like, I'm interested now. You know, there's something really interesting about you guys. Yeah, I mean, that was that was one of my favorite things to watch on YouTube, actually, the backstage pass. I don't know what happened to it, but yeah. it was like, I would always go look for that. I didn't even care really about some of the races that you guys were doing. I just cared to see like how people were progressing. So like that's kind of something that we took into consideration as well. Just trying to get 
uh, people to understand and, and know the other writers and even ourselves, right? Oh, and that's right. And like, you, you, what is the mission now of sort of the team? You know, you've started this up. You, you're looking for these characters. Um, what's the overall mission of this team moving forward now? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's changing every day. Things are catching on so fast that like, you know, where we thought we would be, we we're like here. So like the mission now is to basically build a league that, you know, can support yeah. people that race in America. It, we want to create another lane in cycling. It doesn't have to be like Europe or, or nothing, right? Because like a lot of the times even I was on a pro team uh, or a continental pro team and there's no pay. Right. So like we just want to create a sustainable mm. uh, lifestyle for cyclists that don't go over to Europe. Well, tell me about Europe then. Like, I guess for you, why not Europe? You know, why in those times, this is always sort of the dream, I guess, you know, especially mm. from Australia. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming also from the US. Oh, Europe, it's the place, you yeah, know, especially yeah, yeah. with soccer. We talk about that. That's where the league is. You know, and cycling, especially, that's where the league is. We are talking about something different now. We just said we're trying to break free of that. Yeah. But there would have been some point in your career where I'm assuming that was the the goal, the the top of the mountain. I need to go to Europe. I want to go and check it out. What about why not Europe then? Yeah, I mean, for me, I honestly just didn't get a chance to go. I was uh, I was left off the U.S. national team, where like you know the kids go over, they do uh, junior rube, under twenty three rube, and it's like I was pretty good i would like you know i would be mm. at nationals i would get you know top five every year in the crit and then i'll be top 20 in the road race for some reason you know i never got the chance to go over so like for me it wasn't it wasn't even an option and like the one time yeah. someone would t- was going to take me over it was like ten thousand dollars or something so like we couldn't even afford it. yeah yeah and is it is it still now something that you think or well, it's completely gone now you're like look we got our own scene here now this is something that interests me more building this league and I have heard whispers of you know something that you guys want to start your own race series in 2023 you know having your own second team potentially launch Mm -hmm. what is this whole idea now that you're like cool I get what they're doing in Europe but like you said already now we want to create our own league here that people can get involved with build up American cycling again Mm -hmm. I mean yeah for me honestly I like would give Europe a shot. Uh, I'm not like against it. I am like deep into like what we're trying to build here. Uh, Justin takes care of a lot of like the back end stuff, so I have a bit more free time. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we we understand that you know if you want to see change, you have to do it yourself. So it's hard to try and like make people create these teams or try to like have them follow what we're trying to do. So we figured if we want to see the change, we have to do it ourselves. Tell me about then what the scene that you guys are dominating now that exists sort of now because I feel like the US cycling scene is actually sort of dead. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is this small little glimmer of hope um, and this scene that you guys are dominating at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy to see the type of people that latch on to our team, right? Like our extra, extra large and our extra large jerseys, they sell out before any of the other jerseys, right? Yeah. So we, we are like, getting people into the sport and and that's like really important for us right so like if we can create this crowd and then like get sponsors to see it right that's that's the whole thing right we have our instagram i think we're almost at a hundred thousand followers right like yeah i think uh i looked at it we were uh, the seventh most followed cycling team in the world is that right yeah it's something around there that's that's what i saw last time so like we are getting eyes in and and with that comes the money so hopefully with the money, yeah, yeah, we can yeah. build back up the American scene. Like we still have guys like our juniors are are ridiculous. Like even the under twenty three yeah. guys, like Brandon Nolte, uh, Sheffield, he just yep. won like a big race over there. So like the scene over here is. So these guys Brandon came through there. Legion. No, 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 they didn't come through Legion. We just oh, like right. I'm saying that you know the talent. We still have the talent here. Yeah. yeah. That, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think guys are still you know the goal is still Europe. Hopefully we can create something where the goal could be Europe or uh, stay in America, right? US. That has to be, you know, funded. I do think, I do 100% agree that the the cycling 
talent coming out of the US has definitely taken another sort of rampage. You know, you got Sepp Cuss there as well, Nielsen Paulus, teammate of mine, old teammate of mine. These guys are setting the new trend after, you know, sort of TJ Van Garden sort of had to hold, try and fly yeah. the flag there yeah. after that sort of, um, you know, Lance Armstrong sort of period as well. So there was that dip. Um, but I feel like it's it's making a massive comeback. Um, yeah. I, and they're sort of a force to be reckoned with. After Lance, man, cycling here, like they still they still make every course in America. Like I'm doing Redlands and there's a, a stage yeah. of 10,000 feet of climbing. Like and they're still looking for Lance Armstrong. It's the funniest thing in the world. A lot of our, our stage races are won by time trials because there's a time trial and then there's like something that's relatively hard but it like doesn't finish up a climb. Like it would be like mm. 30 people will always get to the finish line. So if you can't time trial, you can't win. So I think, I feel like our races are still tailored to Lance actually. What's the, what's the perception or the reception, sorry, the reception from like the U S um, sort of cycling scene about you guys sort of trying to get this ball rolling, this sort of, I wouldn't say completely different, but yeah. you know, a really sort of attractive, cycling scene to like we've been saying the whole time to this the u.s fan base i mean the people outside of the people that don't race love it and then some of the people yeah. that do race they hate it i mean like we're we're dominating mm. a lot of the times and like if you're not on the team that's winning you kind of don't like them so i feel like we receive good and bad uh feels from people but the people outside love it well, how are you building your team now? Um, you know, what's your what's your run me through your roster because, like we said already before, um, the team is all about sort of understanding the characters. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, when I've when I've sort of watched your results and even watched some videos of you guys going to these series, you do dominate the race. So it's also choosing the physical ability, not just sort of the the cool characters out there. They actually have to go good too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, How's that dynamic? Because, you know, like I've said at the start, you and your brother started this team. It's a whole new game, mm-hmm. um, as I can imagine. I'm not having started my own team. It's an idea of having a team. Then you've got to have the sponsors, the organization, logistics. But then there's also people management. Yep. You've got to choose the roster. You've got to let people go. You've got to sort of have the hard line. Tell me sort of the insights. Of, it's a bit double sort of question here. What it's been like running your own team, the logistics stuff, but then when it gets down to the actual riders as well. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. You know, like you having to choose people and leave people at home. And, and these people are our friends, man. Like we've known mostly everyone on our team for 10 years, right? So like we have a couple of people like Tyler Williams. He wrote for uh, Cycling Academy, right? And uh, Freddie Obet was on also Cycling Academy, did some BMC stuff. So we have some of these people that are like, that we know as friends, right? And we know that they're cool and they also have the ability to race their bike, right? So like, that's kind of what we're looking for. We're looking for people that we've known for a while or even new people, but we always interview, like we interview people for, for our team and it's usually yeah, right. three of us, like me, Justin and Tyler Williams. We, we talk to people, we figure out their vibe and, and that's kind of how we uh, go about it. And then what about when you're in the actual race? Um, it really does remind me of the old UHC train mm-hmm. um, with like Hilton Clark running the show there. And, you, you know, they're, from what I understand, their philosophy was we're not here just to win. We're here to get first, second and third. <laughs> and um, without ne- literally saying that, it's yeah. sort of what you guys have done in a lot of your races. Yeah. Tell me about that nitty gritty sort of l- the lead out, you know, what you guys going to the front, even from some of these crits, you're just going – we're just going to ride from minute one, yep. and then we're also going to try and sweep the podium. I mean, that's where these guys that have super talent come <laughs> in, right? Like this guy, Tyler, I keep talking about him because he's like well, like yeah. one of my favorite guys on the team. He like literally would take a 10 or a 20-minute pull at the beginning of some of these races, right? And then he would be like one of my last lead-out guys. He's so strong. Yeah. And like in crits, there's a lot of turns, right? So you have a lot of zeros in your power. And you can recover through some of the turns if, you, if you're if not a turn well enough. Uh, a lot of the times, first, second, and third is not really the goal. But when it happens more and more, you know, that third guy that's in front is thinking yeah. more and more like, man, I can hold on and get third. So, like, the lead-out train starts going later and later and later until, like, the three guys in the train are sprinting for first. 
for us, you know, it's, it's not always the goal to get first, second, and third. But if it's there, you know, the extra money is, is great. The thing is, too, like, why would you lead out any earlier than you have to? You're waiting for that rush. You're waiting for the, the other teams to come over the top of you. Yep. If they're not going to come, yep. you're just going to keep waiting because that's the, the logical way to still win the race. Exactly. If you go too early, you're going to expose yourself, and then these guys have got a chance to come around you. So... Apart from sweeping the podium, I'd say to these other teams, they need to start stepping it up and coming earlier. Ex- well, I don't want to tell them what to do, but yeah, exactly. So, like in current <laughs> yeah. racing, in current racing, there, with all the turns, like the earlier you get there, the better, because it's chaos behind, right? So, like mm. if your team is not, uh, if they if they can't stay together, then we usually have like ones and twos or three people at most trying to come past, but like. You know, these guys, they're super strong and super talented. So, like, coming past the fourth guy in our train, this guy can literally win the sprint, right? So, so mm-hmm. you come out of corner trying to, like, come past at, on the last lap, and there's not enough space, there's not enough speed. So, like, they would have to get there probably 20 minutes before and ride as fast as they can. 20 minutes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, it would tell me about your sprinting then. Like, did you learn a lot from your brother? You know, Justin Williams is a pretty household name sprinter um, from the US, but also around the world. I think a lot of people know his name. He's super fast, explosive sprinter. You're slightly different, mm-hmm. can get over a few clumps. You're actually quite a small guy. Um, I think you're even under 70 kilo. Um, and you can 65, well under. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And just you know, you still hold you still hold a very good punch. So, did you learn a lot from growing up with your brother um, through that sort of racing each other, or how have you guys sort of worked together over the years? Because you weren't always in the same team. Yeah, for us, uh, like I said, my dad was a sprinter. He wasn't like a big pro or anything. He was like mid level category, and uh, he had a lot of knowledge. Though you know, we pride ourselves on on learning from you know our surroundings. So. We did uh, practice yeah. crits uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and then we raced on Sunday, right? So there's practice crits. What the three of you? Yeah, oh, all of us. It was so we have a middle brother. So it's four of us. My dad. Oh yeah, sorry. And my three. Four of you. Yeah. And my three brothers. We would all be in the same practice crits four times a week. <laughs> So like, there's just so much happening that like you just learn so much because you always I can't be always beat Justin. If the race is not hard enough, I won't beat Justin, right? So I would have to make it harder, or I would take him off the front, and that's that's the way I would beat him. So like, we just had so much race simulation that you know we've learned how to win in so many different ways. How'd your dad go in those races? <laughs> he started getting too old, man. He started he started surviving, but he <laughs> definitely wouldn't win. <laughs> I'm waiting for the transition because I remember the transition with my own dad that, you know, when I first went riding with him doing a 50K ride was like pretty damn hard. Yeah. And then they got this transition where he he would be like, Mitch, get on my wheel, you know, yeah. it'd be fun because I'd motor pace at a really high speed. Yeah. But then ultimately it sort of changed to dad, come on, yeah. get on my wheel and get home. It was a very quick transition. And with my own son now, he's only five years old, but I'm like, he's already so good. Yeah. I'm like, this transition's going to be way too early. I've got to slow him down. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious. For me, uh, my dad was a little older. Like, he more raced with, he actually raced with Justin and he would lead Justin out in some of the, the mid level races. For wow. me, I didn't, I got to race maybe one year with him at the mid level races because I'm like 30 years younger than he is. So, for me, it was more at the local races where, or not the local races, the, the training crits where, you know, I got to sit behind my dad and, and get that transition. I can't believe you guys had training crits, family. There was just, just you guys or you actually other people came. Oh, there was other people. Yeah, it was like... The, the, oh, right. So... Yeah. I envisioned it was just the four of oh, you... no, 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 no. ...on a circuit yeah. doing a family <laughs> training crit. I was like, this is so good. No, no. It, it was uh, it was like 90 people, man. They, these things are super popular. Oh, right. We would do <laughs> right, family races been on the bike in- path, though. So that was on uh, um, other yeah? days. Yeah? Okay. So who's involved now with the team? Just the, just the three brothers now? Is your dad sort of involved in the back scene of the team, or any, has he got any involvement? Yeah, my dad. He basically like gets the tents ready. He gets he just packs up the van and, and get it ready for the race now. So yeah, we have a we have a couple people on staff, but yeah, mostly my brothers are involved with running the team. 
And when you say in running the teams that you and Justin um, sort of sort of running, how's it all work? Who's who gets what role, and how's yeah, it yeah. all sort of how's it all worked out over the years? So Justin is doing business development, and I'm doing social media, and then my middle brother is doing the mechanics stuff. Yeah, right. Okay, nice. Oh well, fantastic. And tell me about. Um, the kit, because this is something I'm really interested in. I think it is really cool how you guys have been able to bring that um, American sort of US vibe to it, even you know with the gold chains. Mm-hmm. Um, the kit itself, you know, it's made by Rafa, but it stands out on its own. Um, the champions jerseys that you wear as well. Tell me a little bit about the kit and the the vibe that you wanted to portray with with the team. And that's the the hardest decisions we make all year, man. Our kit is the yeah. most important for us. We want to be super proud of what we're wearing. So, like, it's funny because we we focus so much on the normal kit that sometimes we don't really want to wear our champions jersey. <laughs> we just want to be in the in the regular kit. But yeah, we work hard with Rafa and their designers to come up with something that we're really proud of. Yeah, nice. I think it, I think it's really working well. Um, it's like you said with a lot of people who want to even just wear the kit and it's, it's coming back to that same point i keep saying it's creating this this following this this thing that cycling has missed over these years um and especially the european side well yeah the main side is that it's hard to follow i mean it, it, it kind of sucks man well, i was growing up and i would want to wear like you know mark cavendish is like my favorite cyclist of all time and like i wanted to wear a jersey but it's not cool to wear a pro tour jersey Mm. it's kind of weird i'm like well in other sports i have a kobe jersey i have a lebron james jersey so why can i have like mark cavendish's jersey and i think you know we have to get out of that uh that the way of of thinking of like oh you can't wear you know a world tour jersey because that's actually dollars for the whole the whole operation do you think you've been able to break that down for us yeah i think you know for us, I feel like we've made we've made it uh, welcoming, you know, to wear our jersey, where you know some of these other teams are just like not giving the people enough like insight to feel like you know they belong in the jersey. I guess I would say. Hmm. Interesting. Well, what have you been able to learn through all of this? Like this process, coming into cycling. Um, finding your own way and then ultimately getting with your brother and going, you know what, we need to create our own team for a whole lot of reasons. Mm-hmm. You know, what have you been able to take away from this this whole process, which is still ongoing, you know, yeah. which is like we've spoken about. The, it's it's sort of in the really just bubbling away now before it's going to explode, um, if it hasn't already. But I feel like you guys see a much bigger picture. Yeah, like I said, the, the overall goal is is creating something where, you know, people could – live in America and, and race bikes, but it's, it's growing so fast that we're always playing catch up. So like, it's so, yeah. it's hard to hang on to things. We're just going and going and going and going. But you know, what I've learned is giving back to the people is the most important thing you could do. Cause once you have people on your side, the, the sponsors are going to come. Right. So like, mm. just be nice to people, you know, they are going to be the ones that get you that contract. That's going to pay, you know, a lot of money. Are you getting a lot of guys knocking at the door who want to be a part of the team now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, I get a ton of, of uh, emails that are not in English. <laughs> I'm like, uh, what is that? I don't... And then I just see a resume. I'm like, oh, this guy's pretty good. But, like, it's not only about being good. You know, you have to, like, fit into what, what we're actually doing. Because, like, I remember uh, bringing Freddie Ovet over for the first time. And we did a race in Utah and we flew over yeah. and then we raced that afternoon. And I don't know, some, some reason me and Tyler, we felt really good. And Tyler is just like pushing like 450, 500 on the front. For, we did an hour and a half. I think my average was 325. 325 oh at 65 kilos. So he, Freddie was dying. He's like, dude, I, people said this is easy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he's, uh, he's a, a proper he, he's a proper freak. Yeah, yeah, man, his numbers are crazy. He was second in uh, Zwift Worlds. Well, tell me, tell, tell me a little bit about Zwift too, because you guys are you know sponsored by Zwift, and was that something that um, we all got involved with in in lockdown? Um, something 
I was a bit, I wouldn't say I was against, but I was just like, I don't really need a, a computer game yeah. to do ergos, you know, because I came from the old, I'm not the old school, but a bit more old mentality. The old school of, where you sit on the ergos table for are just four done hours in, and look at the wall. Yeah, well, yeah, just in a dungeon, yeah, you know, exactly. with your music on, your heavy metal Metallica <laughs> playing and just smash your efforts out. So I was like, I don't need a computer game. But all of a sudden I was like, maybe I do. Yeah. This is actually awesome. Um, have you guys converted across because... Yeah, I feel like you guys are real racers in terms of, well, you are, you know, that's what it's about. It's about feeling out there in the crits, the crowd, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's about that whole atmosphere. And then you get into Zwift. How's it been for you, that transition, for, you know, doing a lot of ergos? For me, I'm just, I'm just competitive, man. So like yeah. I'm competitive and I love games. So like it was kind of the perfect thing for me, especially with lockdown. Cause like we didn't get to race for a long time and I was kind of going crazy. So once I like, got on this thing and you know it's not easy you get your ass kicked on zwift and i'm like dude there's no way this guy can beat me so like i started doing it more and more and trying to understand the game and so like i got a lot better at it and it just became fun to me i just used it as a tool like i would mm. go out and do two three hours and then come back home and do a race that's an hour long and it's really hard so i just used it as a tool to get better are you still using it now now you can go out training and stuff <sighs> As he just shows me his bike, pointing <laughs> like, at the Zwift, like, set up, ready to go. I probably ride, I ride outside in the morning and I always do like an hour on Zwift. Like every day. I do two a days every day and I just do like a, a cool down so my legs are, are better for uh, tomorrow morning's ride. Do you have a station set up the whole time? Because I feel like that's key. Yes. I have, I have, I think, three bikes. I usually have my TT bike on there. But yeah, I have a bike on there at all times. Yeah, that's the key, isn't it? Because if you have to come home and set it up... <laughs> it's, yeah, um, that, that will be a lot to do. Tell me about when you're riding around now um, in the general public because training in LA is a bit of a different sort of beast, I can imagine. I've yeah. only been there on holidays, but I didn't really feel like I wanted to go riding there. <laughs> um, it's a lot of traffic and you, know, you can eventually get out from what I understand once mm -hmm. you get out past Santa Monica and things like that. Um, What's it like now, the reception of you riding through a place that you've grown up? Are you now a recognized sort of rider? Are people, is, it, is the scene changing? Because in Melbourne, the scene has certainly changed. When I was starting to grow up, I'm not saying it was bad, but yeah. you were a bit of a minority. But now it's like, it's just so many cyclists. It's just forced on the, the cars and the public that, okay, we just got to accept these guys riding bikes. Yeah. How is it for you personally um, riding through you know LA now with this the legions of LA, yeah. um, but also just how cycling's changed. For me, uh, we moved, we actually moved out of LA. I lived in uh, South Central, so I, it would take me 30 minutes to ride to a bike path. Then from the bike path, it would be 30 minutes to Santa Monica, then 20 minutes through Santa Monica to PCH, and that's where finally you can actually train, right? So you have like an hour and a half of junk miles. So like mm. we had to get out of there, and I moved actually by um, Mount Baldy. So I live I live near oh, yeah. Mount Baldy. And dude, there's cyclists everywhere. So like you get a lot of respect from the cars around here because they're so used to seeing cyclists on the road. What, where's the in legions of um, LA, the, the numbers? Where do they come from? The numbers. Oh, the 3-9. The yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's the street we grew up on. Uh, we grew up on 39th Street in uh, Normandy. Yeah, right. All right. It's as simple as that. Yeah, as simple as that. And we just uh, did a little homage to where we grew up. Yeah, nice. It is a nice little fit. Oh, well, and then lastly, mate, um, we've, we've sort of covered most of it anyway, but if you can sort of wrap it up in a simple sentence, you know, the ethos, the ethos of the team, and we've spoken about where we wanted to go, but if people can walk away from this thinking, okay, Legions of LA, what is the ethos of, ethos of the team in your own words? I think uh, basically we're we're here to change uh, American cycling. I think uh, if people could get behind that, that that would be great. Uh, we want to create a home for for American cyclists that you know maybe can't make it in Europe. Maybe you know the six and seven hour races are too hard, and, and maybe they need to do something a little shorter. <laughs> Or maybe a little too hard, or maybe just a little too boring. It's just you know spicing it up, getting people more involved with cycling. Um, and it doesn't matter what it has to be, which is sort of breaking down those traditional walls, which I, I love what you guys are doing. Mate, 
great to have you on the podcast and great to sort of scratch the surface of what the team's doing. And I know everyone is going to be following, very interested to see you guys shaping this US scene, which I feel like is, like we said, you've got the riders coming through. Now we're going to get the following and just a whole new vibe into cycling. I love it. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me on here. I really appreciate it. I loved hearing about where US cycling is going, this own league they're creating. They've understood what is needed to revamp the US cycling. And I love that they've taken it on themselves and gone, you know what? We love racing. Let's make it what we love. Let's get the fan base behind it. This team is seriously cool. I love looking at their videos. Go and check it out. Corey is an awesome guy. It was great having him on the pod. And yes, I've got a talking luft with him next week as well. He's a great guest. Hang in for that next week. A big thanks goes out to our sponsor, Rafa, who are helping these episodes come to life this year. Will Jones behind the scenes, putting these episodes together. And of course, Lara too. Guys, thanks for listening. And until next week, cheers. The music in this episode was composed by Pete Shelley. Cheers, mate.